Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this remote learning version of Earth and Sust 425 and Earth 625. I'm sorry I can't be there with you on Thursday to give you this lecture in person because it's one of my favorite topics of the semester. However, I am traveling at a conference for the rest of this week and next. So I'm doing this as a pre recorded video, which I hope you will watch and ask questions about if you have them. Today's topic is, excuse me, environmental microbiology and related chemistry of aquatic environments, especially the impacts of microorganism processes on the generic chemical aspects of the environment with a special focus on redox state and PE following on the discussion we had during lecture five on that topic as well as on organic matter and nutrient transformations in ecosystems um, following on earlier discussions of, for instance, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus cycles that we had earlier in the semester. Now, before we get to those two specialized topics, I did want to review some content. I understand there's a range of backgrounds in the class, and for some of you, you might be able to skip through some of these early parts, which are going to be review of biology that you've had probably at some point in the past, but I did want to give you a little bit of emphasis on some of the topics slash learning objectives listed on the slide, just so that you think a little bit about how they are related to these overarching topics of uh, redox state and organic matter in the environment. Also note that there's reading in chapter five and chapter 21 or 6 and 22 if you're using the ninth edition. And this reading is essentially the same as last lecture. All right, so almost all geochemical processes that occur in the exogenic cycle are influenced by organisms. I've given a list here of some of the really common things, um, such as the production and consumption of organic matter through photosynthesis and respiration, the redox state of the environment by oxidation reduction, the dissolution and precipitation of inorganic minerals, be they um, shells or substrate or um, skeletal elements or cements. Um, many of them are produced by microorganisms. And there's a table, or excuse me, a diagram from your text, which shows you some other processes related to many of the things in my table. Um, you know, having to do with biological activity associated with photosynthesis and respiration, breaking down of organic matter, forming of new organic matter, um, and the like happening in a body of water and the watershed around it. It's also useful to note that many polluted and contaminated environments also have a lot of microbial life associated with them. And they can do chemical transformations that are pretty dramatic. Sometimes those transformations are the same things, types of things that we see in natural environments. Sometimes they're different, but they are critical in the sense that how microorganism populations in contaminated environments drive environmental variables such as redox state, therefore then affects the fate and transport of various contaminant elements, you know, heavy metals, for instance, whose chemical form, what we call speciation and oxidation state can be influenced by PE and by organic matter, whose uh, breakdown products can also be heavily influenced by whether or not the environment is oxidized or reduced, among other things. And we're going to talk about organic matter later in the semester. So we're not going to talk about that specifically in much detail today. We'll talk a little bit about it. And we'll talk about oxidation reduction on nutrients by microorganisms near the end. But we're going to, like I say, focus on um, talking about breakdown products of organic molecules once we've discussed a little bit more organic chemistry. So we can classify life in a bunch of different ways. One way is to divide up metabolisms into two categories, organisms that are producers and organisms that are reducers, sometimes known as autotrophs and heterotrophs, respectively. And you can see the definitions of those two terms on this slide with respect to energy source and the need to create or ingest from the environment complex organic molecule. 
Now this table breaks things up a little bit more into sort of what is the source of energy and what is the source of chemistry. So the top two examples are both autotrophs. The differences between photo and chemoautotrophs have to do with the, chem the energy source, right? Photoautotrophs take light energy and convert them into chemical energy in the form of organic molecules. That's the gist of photosynthesis. Chemoautotrophs take chemicals from the environment that contain chemical energy, usually in reduced forms. And um, they also take carbon dioxide from the environment. And this is how they run their metabolism. Heterotrophs can get energy source either from chemicals or from light. And they don't have the ability in general to synthesize large amounts of organic molecules from carbon dioxide and instead require preformed or what we call fixed organic carbon from the environmental source, usually produced by an autotroph. So where we have autotrophs, we find heterotrophs. Sometimes we can have environments where there aren't autotrophs and are still heterotrophs, but that implies that there was an autotroph further up the line that produced the chemicals that the heterotrophs can use for their organic chemical ingestion. This is another table kind of breaking those same ideas up a little bit more. It provides a little bit more information about the types of organisms and the strategies that they employ. I think we all recognize photoautotrophs across a wide range of different organism types from microorganisms such as, you know, um, cyanobacteria or photosynthesizing plants, um, both in the aquatic and terrestrial domain. Chemoheterotrophs are things like ourselves, um, but also many other microorganisms, fungi that break down, you know, uh, a log in the forest, et cetera, et cetera. We'll talk about chemoautotrophs uh, a fair amount too. These exist in extreme environments, places where we have reduced chemicals such as deep in the earth, deep in groundwater flow, geothermal systems, and the like. But there are also um, chemoautotroph communities in very contaminated environments. And finally, photoheterotrophs is a category we're not going to speak much about during the semester. So um, many microorganisms are very small, just you know, a half to several microns, a micron being a millionth of a meter or a thousandth of a millimeter. And what's interesting is, is that they have a wide range of shapes and sizes, and they tend to have a very high surface area to volume ratio. Of course, surface area kind of affects the rate at which chemicals can be transported through the cell wall, both in and out, which is basically a measure of how effective an organism is at impacting the environment. And because these ratios are so much larger than eukaryotic cells, then um, microorganisms in a mass proportional way can have a very dramatic impact on the environment, especially aquatic environments. Now, your book divides up life into two categories, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Uh, eukaryotes are ones that have a well-defined cell nucleus. They include all the uh, higher um, orders of um, organisms in the plant, fungi, and animal kingdoms, for instance. Um, there are also eukaryotes that are microorganisms, right? Prokaryotes are organisms that lack a nucleus, and they have their genetic material spread out throughout the cell. These include um, bacteria and other categories, which we'll get to in a second. It's important to note that all prokaryotes are microorganisms. And I've just shown you an example there, a picture of um, cyanobacteria, which are some of the earliest known photosynthetic organisms on the planet. Now, there are two taxonomic types of prokaryote using this classification scheme. True bacteria and archaea or archaeobacter uh, organisms. Um, I, when I learned this, I learned um, that archaea were a separate branch of life, and as we'll see in a second, in a molecular phylogeny, that's a more logical uh, approach to the organization. But there are some benefits to thinking about archaea as a subcategory of bacteria. They were discovered in the 70s. What's interesting about them is, is that they tend to be optimized for extreme environments, high and low temperature, high pressure, lots of salts, lots of sulfur, you know, those kinds of things. And so don't necessarily exist in as high of numbers in non-extreme environments, 
where other forms of bacteria are more um, prevalent. They have a wide range of metabolic strategies, much wider than other parts of the tree of life, which make them um, broadly interesting for a variety of scientific reasons, and also things that are able to affect chemical changes in fairly unusual environments, including contaminated environments. And you can see at the very bottom, I've listed some different kinds of organisms that use chemical energy in, during chemosynthesis to form biomolecules, including organisms that we call methanogens, halophiles, sulfolobus, and various others that fit nicely into the redox ladder discussion of last time. So in the classification of life, there's a basic two processes, um, two ways that this has been done. Starting in the 1730s, there was the Linnaean system, which is basically a structure defined by looking at how organisms look. You know, how many legs and arms do they have? Do they have a symmetry in various forms in the body type? Um, you know, what are the various sizes and shapes and masses of the different components of the body? Um, you know, are they vertebrates or invertebrates, et cetera, et cetera. And this system works pretty well for organizing life. It was revolutionary when it was proposed. But more recently, we've learned that molecular approaches provide a lot of interesting information. And this is in, in specifically molecular approaches related to RNA and the proteins that sequences of RNA encode for producing and understanding the role of those things in the metabolic strategies of the organisms gives us the ability to see if multiple organisms or groups of organisms share common strategies to do different things in their metabolism, how old that um, innovation might be in the evolution of life. And it isn't so worried about what an organism looks like, because after all, the macroscopic look of an organism can have a lot to do with what the environment that they're living in is, um, as opposed to how they, you know, um, evolved their um, metabolic strategies over time. So these are the two ways you can draw the tree of life using the sort of classical Linnaean phylogeny on the uh, left and the molecular phylogeny on the right. And so you can see that in the classical um, system, you've got archaea and bacteria coming off of some early common cell, and then those um, eventually branching off into the protozoans. And then finally, the three higher order kingdoms, fungi, plants, and animals together. Now, interestingly enough, if you look at the sort of uh, RNA-based uh, molecular approach, you'll see that um, bacteria and archaea are given as separate, um, you know, different branches on this tree. And this is specifically because the metabolisms and groups of metabolisms that these two different groups of organisms employ are really pretty different in many ways and so su suggest a very different evolutionary lineage. You'll also see that fungi, protists, plants, and animals, the main branches of the classical tree are all thrown into one little eukaryotic branch. Now this is a kind of diagram, which is called a clade diagram, the length of the sticks that connect the various organism groups, as well as the proximity of one organism's name to another, tell us something about how similar or different those organisms are. And you can see that at the genetic level and at the kind of um, biochemical metabolic strategy level, there's a lot more similarity between all of the eukaryotes than there are between them and either the archaea or the bacteria. So from an environmental chemical perspective, when we're interested in the roles these organisms are playing in affecting environmental parameters, the uh, molecular phylogeny makes more sense to use. This is just a couple more notes about how the classical phylogeny was developed. And this is a little bit more detail about how the molecular phylogeny is developed. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about microbial population dynamics. I think everyone recognizes that microorganisms are widely dispersed in the environment. 
Many of them exploit specific ecological niches. And one of these places we find niches are at physical interfaces because these are places where food sources tend to accumulate. Some examples of these interfaces are things like the air-sea interface or the top of a, of a lake, biofilms coatings on rocks or um, on water surfaces, sediment water interface, oxidized reduced interface in soils and sediments, et cetera. And you could probably think of some others including ones that exist within the anthrosphere, such as the interface between a landfill and the surrounding um, substrate. Another thing that's really important to remember about microorganisms is that they have relatively simple life cycles. And so when we start to talk about things like the redox ladder, which we talked about last time, or various other transformations that happen in the environment due to life, it's important to remember that when microorganisms are involved, we don't end up with steady state and constant concentrations of things because of the life cycles of organisms, where sometimes they're growing quickly, sometimes they're not growing quickly, sometimes they're dying back. That biological growth cycle impacts the chemical transformations that happen in aquatic and terrestrial environments. So this is a diagram that I'm sure you've seen at some point of the sort of various phases, the four standard phases, lag, log, stationary, and death of um, microbial population dynamics. The log phase is basically an exponential growth of the numbers of organisms because there are no limitations, meaning there's plenty of food, there's plenty of substrate, et cetera. Stationary phase is, is reached when organisms kind of max out and when they start to overwhelm the environment, there's a death phase. And so this sort of cycle, which can repeat itself multiple times, environments can refresh, we can have succession in environments where one group of organisms does its thing and then dies out, and then another group comes in and does its thing. Um, all of these things are possible. What they do is cause the chemical transformations that we observe to be non-steady state. These are some other diagrams just showing you some other parameters. Um, and you can notice on the y-axis in each case, the effectiveness of the number of organisms in the environment is being measured by enzyme activity, meaning how much of an enzyme that organisms are using to affect a particular metabolic process are expressed in the environment and assuming that that's related to the number of cells that are present. So in the upper panel, the effect of substrate concentration, which reaches a maximum when basically the space is used up. The pH diagram just shows you the kind of narrowish range, one to two units of pH, where most organisms are optimized. They don't have to be optimized at pH seven. That's the example given here. But you can find other populations um, you know, where they're optimized at low pH or high pH. And finally, temperature, which has a non-bell-shaped curve. It's um, because... Um, you know, there's a sort of an ideal temperature for a particular um, set of microorganisms or individual microorganism population. But when you get too high and you start to do things like denature proteins, then there's a very rapid decline on the high temperature side of that diagram. Now, um, organisms do two categories of metabolism. The heterotrophs and the um, autotrophs have these two different categories, although within heterotrophs, you can find various metabolic strategies that overlap within autotrophs. But the net effect of heterotrophic metabolism is to release energy by oxidizing organic molecules, right? And those molecules can be sugar or proteins or fats or whatever. And they store this energy in ATP and simpler organic compounds. And there's a set of reactions that are used to run cellular structures, run our brains, run our nervous systems, et cetera. In autotrophic metabolisms, the energy is coming out of the environment, whether it's light or chemicals, and those are used to take oxidized carbon from the environment, inorganic carbon in the form of CO2, and to synthesize biomolecules. Now, um, you know, there's also two other related processes, anabolism and catabolism. You've probably heard these terms again as well. Anabolism is the set of processes involved in the acquisition, synthesis, and organization of chemical constituents of a cell. 
whereas catabolism is the biochemical activities that result in the net breakdown of complex substances to simpler substances in living cells. And all organisms, including ourselves, use a combination of anabolism and catabolism to run our metabolism. And this is just an example of an anabolic flow of material from on the left side of the diagram, chemicals that might exist in the environment or in the internal fluids of an organism, if it's a multicellular organism, transported through cell walls, the processes that build up macromolecules over a couple of steps, and the production of tissue and membrane, et cetera, out of that. And catabolism is essentially the reverse, and both of these processes require energy, which include things like the ATP cycle or other related ways of easily storing and transforming energy in chemical form. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about photosynthesis by photoautotrophs. As I've alluded to before several times, there's multiple chemical reaction ways we can write this. The simplest formula we've talked about before which is just the production of carbohydrate and oxygen from CO2 and water. It's a relationship that's in your text. And it's useful in a generic way to talk about carbohydrate production and oxygen production or consumption. As written, photosynthesis is the forward direction, respiration is the reverse. Our text uses a slightly more accurate equation called the Fog formula which is written for one mole of nitrogen, and it incorporates the relative proportion of carbon to nitrogen um, in the forming of, uh, you know, protoplasm, especially algal protoplasm, um, as shown there on the right-hand side of that very lower equilibrium expression. I don't really like the fog formula very much for a variety of reasons. <clears throat> the two most important ones being it doesn't include phosphorus, another essential nutrient, and it doesn't include the role of hydrogen ions. So this is called the Redfield equation. Those individual constituents across the top are brought together during photosynthesis to make algal protoplasm with C106, H263, O110, N16, and P in that proportion, plus 138 moles of oxygen. And as in the prior cases, we could also think of respiration as being the reverse, taking that algal protoplasm and oxygen and breaking it back into those oxidized constituent parts. There's something called the Redfield ratio of carbon to oxygen to nitrogen to phosphorus, which holds very well for aquatic photosynthesizing organisms, not so well for terrestrial photosynthesizing organisms. The um, you know, nitrogen to phosphorus ratio is about right. But those organisms require a lot more carbon and carbon and oxygen in the form of things like cellulose to make their backbone, uh, you know, tree trunks, roots, et cetera, et cetera. So this is um, a notion that's been in existence since the early 60s. When you look in the oceans and you look at zooplankton and phytoplankton, those are just animals and plants that are free floating in the water. And you do net toes and you look at comp compositions of organisms from all around the world and the different um, you know, biome zones, you basically find things not deviating too far from the um, redfield ratio average. So you can see zooplankton and phytoplankton are a little bit different, but this is where that 106 to 16 to 1 ratio comes from. So now when we think about the way photosynthesis and respiration works as a chemical equation, I've written a table here based on some stoichiometry of what happens to chemicals when these reactions go. So for instance, for chemicals that exist on opposite sides of the equation, think the first line on this diagram, oxygen and carbon dioxide, if you think about the Chatelier's principle, if you increase something on one side of an equation, you're going to um, force it to move to try and reattain equilibrium by, um, if you've added something, you will consume some and, and react back to the other direction. Or if you take something away, you'll make more of it and cause the reaction to proceed in the opposite direction. When I say oxygen and CO2 change, one goes plus and one goes minus, it means if oxygen is going up, carbon dioxide is going down in a ratio of 1.3, which just comes from the stoichiometry of the Redfield ratio equation, on the prior slide. Nitrogen and phosphorus, which sit on the same side, they sit on the reactants side of the equation when written as photosynthesis, 
change in the ratio of 16 to one. When one goes up, the other goes up. When one goes down, the other goes down. And all these other relationships just derive from the stoichiometry of this chemical reaction. Okay, so um, whether we're talking about bacteria or archaea, we can find members of both heterotrophic and autotrophic populations. And together, they have a major impact on many important environmental parameters, such as the fate and transport of organic matter, the fate and transport of heavy metals, and the overall redox state, which can therefore also affect ecosystem parameters. So if you recall from last time, respiring organisms will use up oxygen to produce H2O in the process of, org of oxidizing organic matter, and that's called aerobic respiration. Now, if there's no oxygen, if we're along a flow path, the oxygen is used up or in an oxygen limited environment for some other reason, we can still have respiration. It's just called anaerobic respiration, and organisms are using something other than oxygen to oxidize organic matter. The important thing about this is that for both types of respiration to occur, we need to have a source of fixed organic carbon, reduced carbon that organisms can use to liberate energy. And what oxidizing agent they use to do that oxidation determines whether we call it aerobic or anaerobic. But if we're in an environment without much organic matter, then we're not gonna have much aerobic or anaerobic respiration because there isn't much food source for the respiring organisms. Now, interestingly enough, once the oxygen is used up, this is when the redox ladder that we talked about last time plays a role. And so therefore microorganisms play a role in poisoning the PE in anaerobic respiration conditions. And that poisoning of the PE, which is a member kind of a redox buffering situation, also can therefore affect the oxidation reduction and therefore fate and transport of many heavy metals, as well as organic matter degradation pathways, as I've already alluded to elsewhere in this lecture. Okay, so now let's look at uh, redox transformation by microorganisms. You know, when we take materials from the interior of the earth, ores, for instance, we mine them out, they form at conditions not in equilibrium with the atmosphere. They're almost much, always much more reduced than things that sit at the surface of the earth. And when we pull, for instance, minerals out of the ground um, and there's some pyrite in there, that pyrite will oxidize. It will react with oxygen to oxidize both the reduced sulfur of this present in the form of S2 minus, as well as reduced iron in the form of Fe2 plus. Doesn't happen all at once because if you recall from the redox ladder last time, the electromotive force associated with the sulfide sulfate transformation happens at much lower voltage than what would happen for iron um, two to iron three transformation. So in this particular example, what I've shown you here is a oxidation of the sulfur in the pyrite, taking sulfide to sulfate, but liberating reduced iron, Fe2+, it isn't being oxidized here. You also see a fair amount of acid is produced. In fact, high, uh, sulfuric acid is the product of this chemical reaction. And while without organisms present, this is kind of a slow oxidation, but organisms can make this happen very, very quickly. I've given you the example here of thiobacillus ferrooxidans, which can make this transformation happen very quickly and is one of the reasons why we see um, very acidic fluids sometimes leaching out of mine tailing piles. We call it acid discharge or mine acid discharge. Now, there's still reduced chemicals in this waste stream, namely the iron 2 plus, and there are other organisms called gallianella is one category of organisms that can take the iron 2 plus and oxidize it to iron 3 again, using it as a source of chemosynthetic energy to run their metabolism and therefore making these waters go from relatively clear to rust colored when iron goes from plus two to plus three. And this is how gallianella does it. It basically takes the iron two plus, oxidizes it with oxygen, consumes some of the hydrogen ions produced um, you know, by the last step and liberates uh, oxidized iron into the environment. And they do this by making a little micro environment for themselves. Um, you know, within a sort of a membrane. And interestingly enough, they excrete through uh, the cell membrane, these long sinews uh, 
uh, sort of fibrous um, compounds of oxidized iron. They're primarily FeOH3, iron hydroxide, that um, are filamentous. And so these are both types of organisms are typically found in waste streams with a lot of iron in them. And this is what the waste discharge looks like, very bright orange because of the oxidized iron in the water. There's also very low pH, especially from that sulfur oxidation step, which makes these waters potentially very corrosive, very um, hard on the environment, and they can have great impact on uh, ecosystems. Now, just as an aside, you can basically try to drive these chemical transformations in the reverse direction by making little settling ponds with a lot of organic matter in there that you allow to decay, decayed by microorganisms um, and or fungi. And this can help lower the PE again and, low, and allow the uh, iron two plus and the sulfur to re-reduce. And then as the water kind of slowly leaches out into the environment, it will obviously re-oxidize, but you can do it in a kind of a more controlled way. All right, so now let's switch gears and talk about how microorganisms affect material transformations in exogenic cycles and ecosystems. And of course, there's many different ways that they do this. Um, here's three ways I think we can think about when um, we have an ecosystem, especially a terrestrial ecosystem, that depends on nitrogen as nutrients. And remember, we talked about N2 as not being particularly chemically reactive in many microorganism systems or, or, or uh, macrofauna for, or flora for that uh, case. But so there are microorganisms that can take nitrogen and do what we call fixing it, which means take N2 and convert it into nitrate or convert it into ammonium, which then organisms can use as nutrients to support photosynthesis. And so this is a process that microorganisms do, and we'll talk about this in a couple of slides. Microorganisms can also regenerate nutrient elements by decaying organic matter, breaking apart complex biomolecules and liberating the phosphorus and nitrogen, um, as well as you know, good chelating agents, organic acids that can be released into the environment. They also release uh, inorganic nutrients from minerals, meaning uh, in around soil roots, they can help um, set the conditions so that uh, minerals will dissolve and provide new nutrients to plants. So this is a diagram showing you kind of organic matter cycling amongst four pools, living organisms, organic detritus, mobile inorganic nutrients that are dissolved in water, and both organic and inorganic carbon stored in sediments. Inorganic being things like calcium carbonate, organic being kerogen and other you know, sort of petroleum-like biomolecules. And I'm going to go and read through all of the arrows on this slide, but you can see that there are different ways to have fluxes of organic matter, consumption, destruction, um, you know, by, by various means that affect transformations in where we find organic matter in different environments. And of course, microorganisms play important roles in almost every one of these uh, processes. So this is the nitrogen cycle. I showed you this during week one. You can see various chemical forms of nitrogen in the atmosphere, biosphere, anthosphere, and geosphere. And it's important to note that were it not for microorganism transformations on N2, there would be a lot less of the fixed oxidized and reduced nitrogen forms which organisms rely on, and therefore biomass would presumably be a lot lower on the planet. So, um, you know, microorganisms play this critical role. This slide just summarizes essentially what I just said. And this is an example of a flow chart. You don't need to memorize any of the names on here, but you can see that there are names for, for instance, when nitrate is turned back into nitrogen gas uh, by microorganisms uh, leaching out of soil or water. We call that denitrification. Um, that's true if we're working on N2O as well. Chemical fixation is the converting of nitrogen into um, you know, either ammonia or um, nitrate. And um, some of the organisms that do these transformations are in there as well. And there's a lot of redox change associated with this, going all the way from an oxidation state of minus three to plus five. Now, biological nitrogen fixation takes a bunch of different mechanisms, but one of the common ones is through um, an enzyme called nitrogenase. Many land plants use nitrogenases that look like this, that 
help the plant take energy from the environment and use it to do transformations on nitrogen, which can then be incorporated into algal protoplasm. And those electron transfers happen along little iron sulfur molybdenum clusters. So in a sense, it's a redox reaction, right? We're maybe taking N2 and making N3 out of it, or we're taking N2 and making NO2. Those are examples of a reduction and an oxidation respectively. And to do that, we need some other molecule to do the opposite, right? One thing gets oxidized where another thing gets reduced or vice versa. And so these metal clusters within this nitrogenous molecule um, can help make this happen and therefore allow for uh, that kind of me metabolic activity in plants. Now, this is very energy intensive because nitrogen as N2 has a very strong triple bond, um, but it can be done. And um, when this happens, nitrogenases can make fairly reducing environments, at least locally where it's doing the chemical transformation, in part because nitrogenase is very sensitive to oxygen, right? You have oxygen present, then nitrogenase can't do its thing of breaking apart nitrogen. And so again, the role of microenvironments become very important uh, here as they did in the iron two plus oxidation by Gallianella. So here's just some examples of some of the ways that nitrogen is converted into plant utilizable oxidation states by a couple of categories of uh, organisms in um, now mostly focusing on terrestrial ecosystems. So it can be free living bacteria in the soil or there can be symbionts that live within or on roots or structures that exist um, within or on roots. And these can exist in both um, non-symbiotic and symbiotic forms with the plant, meaning in a non-symbiotic sense, they're just base their metabolism on this and they don't really care if the uh, products of their metabolic activity are useful to another organism. In symbiotic relationships, both organisms get something and give something to the other through the relationship so that the release of um, you know, fixed nitrogen is something that other molecules can, or other, excuse me, um, microorganisms can rely on um, if there are um, you know, um, symbiotic organisms that are fixing nitrogen and soil roots. And at the same time, maybe those symbiotic organisms are getting fixed organic carbon back from um, the plant, which gives it basically a food source. So nitrogen fixing bacteria um, can form symbiotic associations with several different classes of plants, especially legumes like clover and lupin and trees like alder and locust. And this is just a picture of some um, root hairs with these visible nodules, which are associated with the nitrogen fixing bacteria. So um, in this case, the plant supplies a simple carbon com compounds for the bacteria, and the bacteria converts the nitrogen into a form that the plant can use. Now, finally, we're going to talk about the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus doesn't have a change in oxidation state like nitrogen does. It's all pretty much the same phosphorus that we find in the environment but it's got very different solubilities depending on whether it is in an inorganic or organic form and whether or not the organic form is natural or xenobiotic, especially in the form of many pesticides and other types of insecticides that it was designed to operate on. And so we can see here that we find phosphorus in soluble and insoluble forms within the biosphere, geosphere, atmosphere, anthosphere, hydrosphere system, but not as much in the um, atmosphere as we might find for um, nitrogen because some of those species are gaseous, but still a significant role. And there are arrows which represent fluxes and chemical transformations, all of which depend on microorganisms and the relative number of them and what their life cycles are telling us in terms of rates of turnover of populations. Now, um, there isn't a direct analogy for um, the way phosphorus is stored and impacted in plants um, to the story for nitrogen, but there are some kind of quasi analogous situations that happen in some fungi, which, um, you know, make these little zones called um, abruscules or uh, bruscular structures that 
um, are able to bring in phosphorus even when it's in a low solubility form in the environment, pre-concentrated, and then affects changes to it and transfer it back out into the system for other organisms to use. So in a way, this is sort of analogous to the um, you know, rhizome uh, situation for um, you know, plants and nitrogen oxidation. So that uh, ends the presentation. Please do send me an email if you have questions.